this is an unlawful procession. As no permit has been issued, any persons continuing in procession on any carriageway or footpath will be committing an offence. I repeat, this is an unlawful procession. As no permit has been issued, any persons continuing in procession on any carriageway or footpath will be committing an offence. September there was a major confrontation according to Mr. Bjorki Peterson um, between anti-uranium protesters in Sydney and um, the uranium shipment of yellow cake out of Sydney and the day after that occurred Mr. Bjorki Peterson said I think from his Kingaroy farm that there would be no more demonstrations in Queensland that the day of the political demonstration was over and they need no longer apply for any permit because they will not get any. And he more or less used that uranium demonstration in Sydney as the reason, the rationale for coming down against all demonstrations, all political demonstrations in Queensland. And he said that he wasn't going to let that happen here. In June 76, the Queensland Cabinet cut off all funding to the Women's Health Centre, Rape Crisis Centre and Women's Refuges. The denial of funding coincided with Bjorka Peterson's support for reactionary women's groups, such as the Women's Action Alliance, which supports the ideal of keeping women in their home, obscuring the fact of rising female unemployment. In May 1976, women held a demonstration over the use of a false complaint charge after a woman had reported a rape. It was put down very violently, but women have continued to campaign for changes in rape legislation and have been prevented speaking and demonstrating on this issue. Abortions are unobtainable in Queensland except for the rich. Women have to fly to Sydney for abortion or go to the backyard abortionist. And wandering slowly up the straight now is migrant woman looking, to say the least, a little confused. I think we'll try and have a few words with her. Um, can you understand me? How are you going in the race? I stand all day on the factory floor. Picking out reject potato chips. I get varicose veins and my legs swell. How the hell am I supposed to race? I get abused. I'm called Rog and Dago by the foreman. The boss tells me that it doesn't mean 13. That means one more for him. I get paid rates that no one else would take, not even my husband. But nobody tells me they're the wrong ones. At the moment, we are as deaf mutes. Not only can we not speak English, we have no common language. In the factory where I work, we have Vietnamese, we have Spanish and Italian, we have Romanian, we have Yugoslav, and we have Indians. You think we don't know about unions. In Spain, we fight in the streets for unions. We've been killed fighting for unions. We know what union means. You think we need you, you need us. Teach us English. And then we can fight for our rights, yours and mine. Yeah, well, uh, back to the race, Sergeant. Good school girls still a length of half ahead of the rest of the field, but what's happening? Well, uh, I'm not quite sure, Kill. I can't believe this. They stopped running the race and they're starting to help each other. What does it mean, Kev? Is this the end of the famous Women's Day Classic forever?
Peterson can be got rid of is for the um, is for the the conservative government to get rid of him and I think he has yeah. to be get, got rid of internally and I think yeah. that if we look at the the perhaps the increasing division between the Liberal Party and the National Party um, that, that there may be some hope for that in the future I think that if we look also to a certain extent at, at, at a federal level um, while in a way Joe I mean in a way Joe is an embarrassment to them um, and, and they, they, they are sort of beginning to stand up to Joe now. On the other hand, you've got the whole thing of, of well, Joe can be used as a testing gun for Fraser to see how far he can go in terms of nuclear societies and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I think that, that, that what's happening now at Queensland is extremely important and it's an extremely crucial part in Australian history for the whole of Australia, not only for Queensland. And that it affects everyone. It affects blacks, it affects workers, and it, and it affects women, and it affects migrants. Um, I, I mean, I can't make any sort of. I, you, you, it's just impossible to make predictions because there are so many things like the, the gerrymander, the relationship mm. between the state and federal governments. Um, I think that the present civil, the issue of civil liberties has done a lot for bringing together the extra parliamentary opposition. It's it, and it, and it's a public sort of. Um, it, it's obviously a, a public point where people can gather and, and join together and, and get solidarity to, to oppose Joe, which previously didn't exist. Mm. Plus it's mm. spread beyond the sort of major metropolis like Brisbane. Right. It's spread right throughout Queensland, you know, to even places like Mount Isa and Cairns and Townsville, all places that are, you know, often way out of the picture in terms of what happens in, big, in right. the bigger cities, yeah. right. which is sure. another, another area which create, it's created a lot of discussion just on, on the very general issue of civil liberties, but also all the other sort of political issues which continuously go on right. in, and in which Queensland. Out of yeah. that and which sort of denial mm. of democracy. Yeah. So democracy. And the whole thing too of Queensland police. I mean, that whole notion of Queen, Queensland police being different from, mm. from New South mm, Wales police, right. it's a lie. Mm, mm. Police are police, mm. and that, there's no difference. And for New South Wales or Victorian or whatever mm. people saying, oh yes, but you've got the Queensland Police. Yeah. Yes, but you've got the New South Wales Police. Mm. You know, yeah, all we're and don't here. forget it, you know, because that they'll be used. You know, like right. this is, yeah. if you want a prediction, I guess Queensland is a prediction in itself for the rest of Australia. Um, and I think it's important that people begin to realise yeah. that and begin to organise not only to support extra parliamentary opposition in Queensland, but just to, to organise within their own states and let their own states know and, and to let the federal government know that Queens that, that Australian that that isn't what Australian people want. Mm. In 1978, Premier Bjorka Peterson announced the takeover of the Aboriginal reserves at Arakoon and Mornington Island. Both reserves were at that time administered by the Uniting Church. Reasons given for the takeover were poor administration and health reasons. The tribal councils at both reserves appealed to the federal government to intervene. Prime Minister Fraser and Aboriginal Affairs Minister Viner stated strongly they would never allow the state to take over against the people's wishes. However, in a spectacular backdown, the federal government formed an agreement with the state that brought both communities under the legislative control of the State Ministry for Local Government. The status of the reserves was changed to that of shires, and like all shire council, they are subject to dismissal by the Minister for Local Government, Russell Hins. Now, unfortunately, after that agreement, was reached and with Mr. Bjorki Peterson, the Premier, whose name is mentioned there, 
he went uh, to the news and uh, Mr. Bjorki Peterson is reported as saying that um, he was claiming victory. No, he won over the federal government. But he said some other very important things. I told them, that's Mr. Nixon and me, I couldn't care less what they did. That's the Commonwealth government. And I warned them of the consequences if they went ahead. There had been no compromise on the takeover, Mr. Bjorki Peterson said, that is, by the state government. That was just thrown into the ring. Uh, that being joint management, was just thrown into the ring as perhaps one way of making it a little easier for the federal government and the church to get out of the spot they were in. Now, I talked to the Prime Minister when I knew of the things that the Premier was saying. And I said that I believed that what he had said was a breach of the understanding and a breach of the agreement that we had reached. And therefore, that I would be recommending to Cabinet next Monday that the legislation that we have prepared should be passed through the federal parliament. I also talked to the Prime Minister and said that I thought I should come up and talk to you people to find out exactly what you thought about it. Because remember, as I said, any joint management has to be acceptable to you. The Commonwealth has a constitutional obligation to Aboriginals. These communities t turn to us and let me only say that the Commonwealth will not fail them. In order to uh, facilitate or bring about further discussions, I'm suggesting to the Prime Minister today that we allow a period of, of cooling down, of letting the dust settle for a few weeks on the basis that they also mark time and think seriously in relation to the proposed legislation they're talking about bringing in. They already have a problem with the first step they've taken, and which uh, won't be well improved by taking the second step. And I, I'm suggesting that to the Prime Minister today, and, and Mr. Fraser no doubt will have to consider it and take it to his cabinet next week. And uh, in the meantime, we're not sending anyone into Arakoon waiting his reply. The Arakoon and Mornington Island Act, now passed through the Queensland Parliament, gives both communities a 50-year lease on their land. In this fiasco called self-management, the Shire councils and Shire presidents have to meet with the approval of the minister, Russell Hins. There have been many trips to Canberra by Aboriginal leaders with appeals to reverse the decision, several standoffs with state administrators being refused entry to tribal lands, but in early 1979 the leases were finally signed. They have no mineral rights to the land and mining companies may now make further application to mine the vast bauxite reserves on Arakoon when the world market picks up. could not make a decision unless I get approval uh, from the minister. Uh, and uh, they don't live it up here, but we do live it here and we know how things are. You know, because we are Aboriginal people, you know, we should put forward to them. But having to uh, uh, take away that rights to make decisions is still like a self -managed. It's also, um, it's completely like sort of dead life for Aboriginal people. It's sort of a step back forward another step instead of going forward. The step backwards? Yes. I, I say is another step backwards instead of forward. We're having a new legislation made because half of that is re sort of restricted to us. We can't really, even though if we wanted to, they just can't because of what it says there. Well, I don't say it's wrong, but I say it's a little bit, you know, not right because we understand the people ourselves who live here all our lives. And we study each person, both men and women, and we understand them. 
So, I don't know. I mean, the, the state, the ministry they might listen to us more and take notice. That's what we need. If, if they listen to us and take notice and act on behalf of our shy here, I think everything will run good. But if they reject and, you know, think something else, well, then we're done. Given that you both think that the situation is unworkable, given that they don't listen to your demands and you're done, as, as Prince Escort puts it, what will be the reaction of the Aboriginal people? Now, in the last week, we saw DIA, DAIA officers thrown off Arakoon. Do you think it'll ever come to that here? I think it'll come to about the same thing that's been what's been happening in Arakoon, because uh, we are shy, we're trying to control our people because it's come firstly from them and we are responsible for their action and uh, because there then, if somewhere I said along the line later in future when this bill turn out to be unworkable, then that means to say they're going to throw it away and there's nothing that shy can do because this community doesn't want it to be worked that way. Are you saying, are you saying that you won't be able to accept, accept responsibility for what the people will do. We won't accept the responsibility of what the people does because uh, it, it faced to the fact that along the line when the, this legislation put through is something against their own wishes and will mm. and well, rejected, you know, not, not all that. Well, can I ask you both then, what do you think the Aboriginal people will do here if it comes to a deadlock situation. Well, what we'll do then, we'll have to just call back on the federal government then to look into this mm. matter. That's the only thing we'll do. Do you trust either government, either the state or the federal government? We never trust nobody unless we see it right in our hands and then, there you are, you can have your land. Mm. There it is. Mm. That's right. That's fair. Okay, so the scenario you've painted so far, the picture you've painted so far is that the thing reaches a deadlock, you then appeal That's to the federal government. Yes. The federal government doesn't help, what happens then? You beg your if the federal government doesn't help, what happens then? Well, then we'll try and um, uh, do something else. Like what? Try, try going out bush. <laughs> The government sort of got an obligation to the Aboriginal people on the side of teaching that culture in during the school hours, which that gives us a chance to teach our children to go back out bush, you know, just the same as when you saw most of our people going out on the weekend. They go back and teach the children of this area what been happening one time and the food they hunt they in that season, every other thing, you know. So if we're going to lose that, we'll lose everything. Federal Minister Ian Viner has now a permanent representative on Mornington Island to monitor proceedings during this transitional period to self-management. The state has done likewise. They have come to offer interim funding and to proceed with reconstruction of houses in Lardell Street, destroyed well over two years ago by a cyclone. The State Department are at pains to intimate that self-management may not be what the Aboriginal people really want, that they are at the mercy of several special interest groups with something to gain from the current situation. They no longer reserve the shires. Do you think this is what the councils have actually wanted? And how do you think the shires are going to work? I don't know particularly what the people wanted, but it seems to be the way it has gone. Um, there was so much protest at the first uh, uh, action, in which was uh, to take over the administration. But, uh, legislation was looked into, and so this new legislation has come in with the. Uh, the reserve with the reserves being declared uh, local authority areas. Right. Um, 
for the people, I don't know that, um, looking around, I don't think the people are that very much concerned. There's a lot of the groups uh, and various bodies that are actively working in the field are, are claiming they are. We've always had a role here on the Mornington Island. Uh, our past role has been uh, to assist uh, the Aboriginal organisation here to become self-managing. Uh, that is, uh, in this case, it's Gun and Amanda as the organisation that we've probably done most work with in the past. Um, there are things like the Cattle Project. We've assisted uh, Gun and Amanda in the Cattle Project. Things like Roadworks. Um, so we've always had that role. Uh, we've always had a role, just the same we've had a role in, in northwest Queensland in, in assisting uh, Aboriginal organisations uh, to become self-managing uh, in line with the policy of, of developing Aboriginal communities. Um, now that role hasn't altered, but specifically on Mornington Island, uh, we will have a role to assist uh, what is the Shah Council to assist that, that, uh, that body uh, to become self-managing. Aboriginal people are the subject of special legislation in Queensland, the notorious Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Acts. These Acts provide for the reserves dotted throughout Queensland, reserves invariably managed by state-appointed white staff. Yeah. Aboriginal councils are elected by communities, but the power over finances, culture, movement on and off reserves lies with the white managers and staff. In one Aboriginal reserve, Dumaji, in northern Queensland, run by a husband and wife team of the Plymouth Brethren Faith for the past 28 years, Aboriginal culture, dancing, language, theatre have been banned as being pagan and therefore non-Christian. Aboriginals can only remain on reserves at the discretion of the manager. They need a permit issued by him, which can be revoked without appeal, even if the family have been on the reserves for years. The Queensland Government's racist policies must be seen to be directly linked to the Government's close ties with mining capital. In the Weeper, Mapoon, Arakoon areas of Cape York, Aboriginals were dispossessed by the bauxite mining giant Kamalco, who were aided and abetted all along by the Queensland Government. The Premier's wife, several government ministers, including the Aboriginal Affairs Minister, benefited from a Kamalco share handout at this time. Bjorka Peterson is determined to repress and break any black militancy for land rights in the north where he sees it interfering with any mining ventures. He says Aboriginal land rights would create an apartheid situation in Queensland. From all this now, the government's changing, or going to change over, and make us change. It'll take all our life and our happiness, our freedom, our ways of hunting, time for camping, and all this will uh, take and be lost from our children because then they will uh, just step right into European style. This is a fruit picking song. The name of this fruit is Wadded. In the European way, they call it wild date. You right? Yes. Right now, make sure you lift up your hand high. Wadida, 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 wadili. Piala, 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 piala. Wadida, 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 wadili. Piala, 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 piala. Wadida, wadida. Good. Again. Back, back, yes. back. Go back. What is a 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 I suppose it depends what you mean by self-government. If yes, you believe that... Well, I think it does. Yes. I think it does. And I think this is very germane to the whole issue. And it depends on the philosophic base on which you see things. Yes. If anybody believes 
that self-government means that indigenous peoples can set up enclaves in the community where they have a different type of operation, a different type of government, a different type of ownership of the land with greater powers than other people have got, then I am utterly opposed to that concept of self-management. And I think rather than self-management, it is utterly self-defeating. But if one believes that the indigenous peoples can be helped to be self-managing in terms that other people are in their instrumentalities, local authorities and so on in the community, of course they can be. And this has always been the aim of my government. And this is what is being done at Arakuna Mornington at the moment. I don't really know who prepared it or, or why they prepared it, but all I know is that the material that I was given that I've got here, uh, I feel is very detrimental to society if children are going to be educated with this type of material. Were you given all this material? Have no, you seen I haven't it? seen all that at all. I've only just so, got so, these So, so how can you be so opposed? Uh, well, can I read some of these things out to show you well, why? Well, very briefly, yes, but um, uh, well, could, more specifically, could you just give us, uh, could you outline just your Just outline a bit. Yes. Uh, well, they, it says here in the introduction that they are uh, presenting the children with uh, two views of future possibilities of different lifestyles from what we've got now. They say that they are expecting a possible widespread change in the family structure in the future, and I believe not only are they expecting it, but they're engineering it. And this is what I'm And this is what you call social engineering, yes. isn't Could it? Could I put yes. the point, Mrs. Joyner, that you are the greatest social engineer in Queensland? I don't think so. I, I only just want to see our traditional lifestyle being maintained because I don't what do, believe... What do you mean by a traditional lifestyle? Well, the uh, Western civilization, the, the idea of a uh, monogamous heterosexual marriage and... And, and you see SEMP as a threat to that? Definitely. SEMP, standing for Social Education Materials Project, is a course of social sciences and humanities subjects on Australian conditions, written especially for Australian schools. The compilation of this course began in 1970 and was a joint effort between the state and federal governments. It has been introduced already into other states, but it has been banned by the Queensland State Cabinet. On the announcement of the banning of SEMP, the Education Minister, Mr Val Bird, stated he was acting on the advice of a state committee. The Education Department knew nothing about this committee, who comprised it or who appointed it. There was no consultation with parent-teacher groups before the banning, although these groups comprise 75% of school parents. But the banning was seen as a personal triumph for Mrs Rona Joyner and her Stop and Care Committees. Stop standing for Society to Outlaw Pornography, Care for Campaign Against Regressive Education. Premier Bjorka Peterson has stated that there should be much greater emphasis on technical education and in a more direct attack. There are apparently people in the education department who don't know what the government want the children taught. But as the more or less leader of that group, Rona Joyner, says, she accepts that she is in a minority and she doesn't mind that because she speaks the truth. The truth is God's truth she knows what God wants and she is merely fulfilling God's will and she has stated in one of her leaflets that one with the Lord is always a majority so that with that perspective there is no question at all of minority rights majority rights she has the truth um, she extends the argument logically from that basis that you know, if the Lord is the truth and if we have got a constitution which is founded on the Christian moral ethics, if we have got laws which are founded on Christian moral ethics, if we in Queensland have got an Education Act which makes it compulsory for primary schools to teach scripture lessons for half an hour a week plus the ordinary religious instruction period, um, she says that we are a Christian country. Um, because we are a Christian country in constitution and law, those laws are right, they are the perceived wisdom of the Lord, and therefore you have to follow them. You have to accept them blindly. You cannot criticize them. She says freedom is the invitation to sin. So that her religious fundamentalism extends into the area of extremely right-wing, conservative, authoritarian political ideology, which suits the Bjorki Peterson government perspective beautifully. Um, it also extends into an economic philosophy, whereby she links the Protestant work ethic, the free enterprise ideology, with the perceived wisdom and truth of the Lord. Therefore, anyone who attacks that, trade unions, uh, Marxists, anyone, is a direct challenge to the Lord and the perceived truth of God. Um, therefore, 
from her perspective, it's entirely logical to argue that anyone who is a humanist, a small L liberal, a socialist, a Marxist, they are all the same, they are all identical, they are opposed to God and they all have to be defeated. Um, and a beautiful example of where this fits in, this fundamentalist Christian political and economic ideology fits in with the economic desires and intentions of the state government and multinational capital is in the Arakoon and Mornington Island dispute in that um, in her propaganda against MACOS, the primary school social studies course which uses Eskimos as one of the major units of study to analyze uh, another culture, another group of people living to compare with the student's own culture and experiences of life. Um, one of her arguments there was she said words to the effect that they are even teaching MACOS to the Aboriginal missions in Arakoon, Mornington Island, etc. And here we are, after 90 years, we're only just getting those people out of paganism, and here we are giving them pagan cultures to study so that they'll revert to their paganism. Now, this fits in closely with the state government's intention to take over those mission stations, I should say reserves, from the Uniting Church, which has gone along with the Aboriginals' intentions of moving out from the central areas of settlement back into their tribal lands in small settlements. The state government wants to bring them under much tighter control, bring them under the ideological control of the state through the schooling systems. Um, simultaneously, if the state government wants to open up those reserves to bauxite mining, they want to have the Aboriginals contained and controlled within a small localised region. They want to open up a lot of the region to the mining companies. So that here we have a beautiful example of how the fundamentalist Christian and political ideology fits in with Bjorki Peterson's political perspectives and with the interests of mining capital and Bjorki Peterson's economic intentions. Rona Joyner has taken an interest in the American-based John Birch Society, which has an extremely right-wing bias. Mrs. Joyner has introduced some of their publications to Queensland Institute of Technology as a counter to quote Mrs. Joyner to some of those Marxist and humanist books. One of these, None Dare Call It Conspiracy, suggests that the governments of the Western world are involved in a conspiracy to introduce socialism. By disseminating material from the John Birch Society, don't you think you'll be seen to be supporting that kind of movement, that kind of extremist right-wing movement, a movement which has been called uh, neo-fascist? Well, as I say, I'm not really uh, overly concerned about what other organisations are doing. I've got my work cut out in just doing what I'm doing and, and making sure that our society is seen to be doing what I believe Christ would have us do. What about Mrs Florence Bielka peterson How close are you to her? Well, I invited her to be the uh, chairman of our meeting when Mrs. Gabler came. I had no idea whether she'd accept or not. I wrote to her and had no idea whether she'd accept or not, but I was very pleased when she did because uh, I think she stands for, she's like a figure representing womanhood in here in Queensland. Do you think she's aided you in your campaign against them? Well, I think that uh, women generally were very impressed by the fact that she was uh, chairing that meeting and she talks to lots of women's groups, I believe and uh, I think that uh, she probably did spread the word around Queensland and I think this is what is, is good, this, this is what I call educating. So it's possible she could have influenced the Premier then, his deliberations on SEMP? Well, I wouldn't know what she does where the Premier is concerned. Uh, I dare say every wife has some a degree of influence on their husband. Do you think that was the case with Mrs. Bjorka Peterson and the Premier? Well, I, I don't know, it doesn't worry me. What the case is, all that worries me is that right is seen to be done. trade union movement has been placed under threat with a right to work legislation, in effect the right to scab legislation. This gives employers the right to exclude union organisers from the workshop and gives all workers, not just union members, the rights to all privileges won by the unions. In spite of these attacks, the Trades and Labour Council have never come out and publicly supported a direct action of mobilisation. They have never endorsed the concept of marching for themselves, except legally on May Day. To this extent, the Bjorka Peterson government has been successful in intimidating sections of the community, in particular the Trades and Labour Council and the Labour Party. The Labour Party don't want to appear radical. They believe the road to electoral success is to appear as conservative and middle of the road as a Bjorka Peterson government without extremes. 
The Siemens Union, however, have been militant supporters of the civil liberties movement, while they have been under continuing attack from the Bjorka Peterson government. In early 1977, they attempted to begin negotiations with Utah, demanding that Utah ships carrying Queensland coal ore should employ at least a proportion of Australian workers. These demands were made, indicating the huge annual profit Utah makes in Queensland, the low taxes and royalties enjoyed, and the large number of unemployed seamen. Utah would not even begin to negotiate. The Union placed a series of bans on Utah ships, and the Premier in Utah responded with writs issued for an unspecified amount of damages in the Queensland Supreme Court. Now, Bjorka Peterson is seeking to deregister the Federal Seamen's Union. He has approached the Federal Government for state powers to deregister Federal Unions. It has been very difficult for the Civil Liberties Movement to form a united coalition against the Bjorka Peterson Government's onslaughts. And I think to understand the need for such a coalition of all the forces opposed to Bjorki Peterson, we have to have a look at the economic and social situation in Australia and Queensland at the present moment. Um, we are going through a period of capitalist crisis in Australia. We are going through a period of long-term structural unemployment. We are going through a period in which manufacturing industry is winding down, it's not investing in new capital equipment, Australian manufacturing is notoriously inefficient within the international capitalist world, it's non-competitive, um, and Australian manufacturing is moving its capital and its investment out of Australia into the cheap and controlled labour markets of Southeast Asia, and then exporting the stuff back to Australia. Um, simultaneously there's are gearing up for a new expansion in the mining industry. And this is not just a multinational venture of the multinational mining companies such as CRA, um, Utah. It is being participated in openly by Australian companies such as BHP, where they have, to a significant extent, wound down their capital investments in manufacturing and heavy industry and expanded greatly into the area of mining, particularly in, it, in the energy field with oil and coal. So that we have this economic situation. We have a situation with, as I said before, long-term structural unemployment and a building up of a, the mining industry. Now Queensland is peculiarly placed in Australia where it has traditionally not had an effective manufacturing sector in the economy. 80% of its exports to other states in Australia have been rural primary products and 80% of its imports from other states in Australia have been manufactured goods. So that Queensland's never had a, a strong manufacturing sector. It's been the state of branch offices, of small petty bourgeois production, small scale capitalist production, um, rural industry on a very decentralised basis. Um, it is also placed today to be one of the major, to receive some of the major benefits of any upturn in mining in Australia. Queensland and Western Australia have got the predominance of mineral resources in Australia along with um, the Northern Territory's uranium. Now if Queensland is going to attract the huge capital investment to develop its mining industries, the present government believes that you have to have a secure workforce, a stable workforce and a docile workforce. A workforce which is hostile to trade unions, is um, willing to go along with the demands of heavy mining capital. Um, a good example of this is Mount Isa where they have produced a classic situation I'd say of paternalistic capitalism where after the 1960s strikes um, Mount Isa mines in those strikes in conjunction with the state government totally crushed the union movement in Mount Isa and since then they have churned in millions of dollars into community projects, building up the schools facilities, building a dam for recreation, um, building parks, everything like this, so that the workers tend to, the town has become a totally company town, all the workers see their future being tied up in, in the company, dependent on the company and they see the company as their provider. 
so that in the last two state elections, Mount Isa has returned a National Party Member of Parliament. Now, these sort of developments are, I think, a good indication of what the Bjelke Peterson government would like in terms of any future mining developments in Queensland. They want company towns, they want um, paternalistic capitalism with an incredibly docile labour force. On December the 4th, 1978, there was a large rally in March in Brisbane sponsored by the Trades and Labour Council. The vote to march without a permit was taken at a council meeting attended by only five or six left-wing members from the maritime unions and the Building Workers Industrial Union. Because of Trades and Labour Council policy of accepting decisions made by those attending meetings, they were forced to comply with this decision to march. Aside from the single aberration, though, the TLC will not be supporting any further marches without permits. The reasoning goes something like this. There is still much work to be done among the rank and file, and until popular mass support among unions has been demonstrated, the TLC feel they are not in a position to take to the streets. This argument conveniently evades the issue of the TLC's own responsibility to generate mass opposition to repressive anti-union legislation and the ban on the right to march. In failing to take a strong stand against measures designed to cripple the labour movement, the TLC is also withholding support from those groups who are prepared to oppose Bjorka Peterson's vision for Queensland, a state laid wide open for multinational profiteering on a huge scale over the silenced voices of blacks, women, unionists, environmentalists and progressive educators. Open attacks on unions are no longer isolated to Queensland. Bjorka Peterson has provided the model for the attempt to create a passive and splintered labour force which is now underway throughout the whole country. The ban on the right to march is a ban on news about the invasion of Queensland by foreign capital and its repressive consequences. It can only be overturned by a unified left which understands that the fight in Queensland is the frontline battle against the resurgence of the right in Australia.